And so, so much of the, you know, the right alignment that we are taught or, or kind of seek in our, in our yoga postures are coming from this guy who, who had an aesthetic, um, you know, desire. He, he liked the way straight lines look. So right away, you know, like those are, we're kind of putting two values that don't necessarily relate to each other. And we're trying to, you know, mesh them on top of one another. The body, which has no straight lines and has, you know, no inherent right angles and, and has no, um, fixed points on top of a visual that looks really good when you can you know get your thigh parallel to the world and your knee at 90 degrees and like there is a there's a visual beauty to that and i and i don't disagree with that but yoga isn't a it's not a visual it's not an aesthetic practice like that if you want an aesthetic practice go do dance that was Derek cook Everyone, welcome back to Seeker in the Sage. My name is Danny Palmplume, and I am your host. I'm coming at you today with episode 140. Derek is on the show today. Derek and I met um, a few years back at Wonderlust, and um, he is this incredible anatomy teacher. I ended up taking one of his workshops out there after a friend introduced us. And since then, we've not only established a really good uh, working relationship, he teaches all the anatomy in my teacher trainings. Um, we also run a couple workshops together, but he's also one of my Burning Man uh, campmates. So we've quickly uh, co- collaborated our lives and not just uh, in a working relationship, but a friendship as well. He's probably the first anatomy teacher that has ever gotten me this excited about learning about anatomy. And it's because he's just so passionate about it and so not knowledgeable about it. Derek and I have a lot in agreement when it comes to alignment-based yoga. And the truth is that I don't really care about straight lines too much in yoga. I think it's a little bit overrated. Um, so we get into alignment-based yoga and why uh, why it's one way to look at it, but it's not the whole entirety of a yoga practice itself. I feel like I'm about to ruffle a lot of feathers. <laughs> a lot of you yogis out there are probably like, what? But um, anyway, that being said, it's nice to have a different perspective. Um, it's nice to understand how the body works. And uh, I hope that you enjoy this episode where we get to kind of dive in a little bit about something I'm so passionate about. It's about teaching um, my version of alignments. Hey, so the show is, of course, run and uh, loved on by you. And without you, this show would not be possible. You can head over to our Patreon page, uh, which is dannypompoon.com slash support. And we just ask that you can uh, make a little uh, donation there. And for less than the cup of coffee a week, $2, you could support the show or you can do it for 5 And we got some uh, free goodies there. I will leave a um, note in a link rather in the show notes. That was hard. Um, Yeah. And if you can't do that, all good. Just make sure that you leave us a review on iTunes because that also helps out. Without further ado, enjoy episode 141 with Derek Cook. Hello, Derek. Hi, Danny. (laughs) That was a little dramatic, huh? I mean, is that it's to be expected? <laughs> Derek, you bought a bus, by the way. But like, before we actually get into the episode, you bought it. Well, maybe we can make the episode about the bus. You oh bought a my bus. God. Talk about dramatic, right? What's wrong with me? I don't. What it? Well, I mean, on yeah. today, on today, this is only a half hour conversation. We can't. We don't ten part episode. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I bought a full size, a seventy two seat Bluebird Vision, two thousand and eight. Um, what inspired you? You know, I like to be serious. I've I've always I've been dreaming about building my. I mean, I'm a builder, so I've been dreaming about building my own home since I was like 15. And it's you know, and then now it's just like I'm here out in the country, you know, teaching mm-hmm. from the internet, and I've got space, and I'm like living on what's essentially 80 acres of farmland. And I just look out every morning and I'm like, I want this in my life. So yeah. the way to get it was to buy a school bus and build it into my dream home. Mm. So now where, how, like, where are you in the process? 
So I just drove it down a couple days ago. Um, I picked it up a couple days ago. Drove this. I've never actually ridden in a school bus in my entire life, okay. except for <laughs> the first time I rode in a school bus was when I drove my own. Um, so I drove it down. Uh, wait, like you've never been me. inside? Hold on, wait, wait, wait. like you and, and you've never been inside a yellow bus before? Yeah, no, no. I went to a private, a little private school, and I drove myself to school um, for you know the majority of it. So wow. yeah, no, I've never been in. I'd never been inside a school bus. I'm more impressed that you're like in third grade driving yourself to school. That's great. Well, obviously, I was a protege. <laughs> I was ahead of my time. I'm sure someone drove, but we never had school buses. My yeah, so my grandma drove me to school. People drove us to school. I mean, um, I think that I think it's super cool, dude. I, what you're doing with it for for me, obviously, my head goes to Burning Man and creating stuff. So I'm you know, like. That's a huge part of it, obviously. These people don't know this, but you took me to Burning Man for the first time last year, and it was huge. And and also, another friend of mine actually built a short bus that she drove to Burning Man for her first time last year. And so, like, that put a little bit of a bug in my in my brain somewhere um, that Build gave me this idea bus, that like, something was possible, you know? Totally. Totally. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I'm like super, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm super stoked for you. I did immediately when you posted about it, I was like, please say you're turning this into an art car. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the home out of the way, but I'm ready. Listen, it, they're not, it's like four grand, man. It's not, a, it's not a big, it's not a big wall to climb to, uh, so yeah, let's do it. As soon as I build this thing, let's build an art car. Let's build a bigger bunny. Yeah. Let's build a bigger bunny. <laughs> Those of you that don't know, like, so, uh, you we're know, we're going to we, need a bigger bunny. We're going to need a bigger bunny. <laughs> uh, my Burning Man camp is called the Sacred Hair. And our, our art car is a, a, is a pink bunny. It's a, it's built off the base of a, of a golf cart. But anyway, it's a pink bunny that drives around playa and plays loud music and serves ice cream. It's really fun. And um, her name is, is Gladys Bright. Right. You can't forget yeah. that part. <laughs> you cannot. because She's bright AF. Gorgeous. Yeah. She's gorgeous. All right. So Derek, let me properly introduce you. I mean, there's definitely you in the introduction, but like you and I, you know, we met at Wonderlust through our friend and we kind of just had this, you know, this connection. And then as I started to get to know you, I really was, I mean, your what I started to really resonate with you was your passion um, for anatomy. And I say this all the time, but there's no one in the world that has ever got me as excited about anatomy as you have. Cause anatomy can be really boring. It's like, go and remember this thing. Yeah. And, it's like dry and a lot of data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you have really, I mean, I've had you now in all my teacher trainings and, or, you know, my, my last few teacher trainings. Um, and yeah, you just bring this whole like excitement and joy of anatomy into, um, into a yoga practice. And what I really wanted to dive into today is, you know, you are, are, are very, um, what is the word? What's the word I'm looking for? A pain in my, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's three words. <laughs> That's three words. You're right. Your conviction behind everything, because I know you've studied so hard, but there was one thing that you said in training to me that really stuck out. And it was, you don't want to call it anatomy anymore. You want to call it something. I don't want to call it alignment. I don't want to call it alignment. alignment. Anymore. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We don't want to call it alignment anymore. Yeah. You know, I've been, I'm kind of known. Well, first let me say thank you. Um, the, what you said about trying to make anatomy uh, interesting and fun and accessible is kind of the greatest compliment personally I could receive. So I really appreciate that. Um, and, and yeah, you know, like I, I'm known as an alignment teacher and that's kind of a, a category of yoga that's out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm on a current crusade to change it from alignment yoga to, uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So discussing like, and I think there's a big difference between, uh, understanding alignment and understanding how we're organized and how we're like organizing ourselves in an ongoing way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is, I guess, well, uh, help us understand a little more about like what um, alignment uh, yoga is. That's a, that's a good place to start. Yeah. yeah so I think al like alignment yoga, um, I mean, I know I will say this. I think it comes from a great place. So I'm, I don't want to throw the whole thing out. But like alignment yoga basically comes from this idea that things are supposed to be in a certain placement. Mm -hmm. Right, you're 
you know, we use the one all the time, your knee over your ankle or your knee over your second toe or something like that. Um, and that when you put the body into specific and correct placements, mm-hmm. then you receive whatever the intended benefit of either the pose or the transition or the shape or whatever, whatever you want to call it. You, the, you, your placement of your body parts allows for the desired outcome. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of, um, I mean, it's, it's a good start, but it's, it's looking at us from the outside in. Right. And it's, and it's largely aesthetic or even when these alignment cues or ideas are um, founded or, or, or based in what we think of as functional movement, it's still, it's still like an outside in approach. Mm. And, you know, we know that it's not an outside in practice. It's an inside out practice. Mm -hmm. So as much as finding proper placement of pieces can be helpful and important and interesting, assuming that alignment equals either like efficiency or, or effectiveness or safety or any of the kind of reasons why we, why we create an alignment idea itself could be a little misguided. Right. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, I've said this before, it's a bold statement and I always ruffle feathers when I say it, but I don't really care about straight lines too much in yoga. I actually, I think bent things are, 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 are beneficial. Um, at least where I'm at in my practice these days, straight lines don't really make that much sense to me. Um, I feel like I can access other areas of my body, not just being like, well, this needs to stack over this. And if you don't stack over this, this is it's you're like stack your knee over your ankle or your leg's going to fall off. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and, okay, so there's so much you just, there's so much you just talked about in there. And, and the first one, straight lines, like there's no straight line in our body. Yeah. The, even like the big bones that we think are straight, they're, they're curved and twisted and crooked and they, and they should be. Um, so the Why? idea of Why should they be? Okay, that's a good question. But hold on. Wait, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, should we, yes. Should we put Excellent a pin question. in that? Okay. Yeah, put a pin in that for two seconds. Okay, okay. okay. A, lot of, a lot of the alignment... Okay, so um, alignment yoga really largely comes from a Yangar yoga. And a Yangar being a specific lineage, you know, Mr. Yangar founded it and, and cut, came up with these ideas um, and sort of like a, um, you know, compendium of shapes and angles. And, and the thing about Mr. Yangar is he loved straight lines and he loved 90 degree angles. Mm-hmm. And so, so much of the, you know, the right alignment that we are taught or, or kind of seek in our, in our yoga postures are coming from this guy who, who had an aesthetic, um, you know, desire. He, he liked the way straight lines look. So, Right away, you know, like those are, we're kind of putting two values that don't necessarily relate to each other. And we're trying to, you know, mesh them on top of one another. The body, which has no straight lines and has, you know, no inherent right angles and, and has no um, fixed points on top of a visual that looks really good when you can, you know, get your thigh parallel to the world and your knee at 90 degrees. And like, there is a, there's a visual beauty to that. And I, and I don't disagree with that, but yoga isn't a, it's not a visual, it's not an aesthetic practice like that. If you want an aesthetic practice, go do dance or which all are, are great ideas, but that's an aesthetic practice. That's like, you know, there's nothing necessarily good for you about uh, the kind of point of a foot that someone like Misty Copeland can get, right? It's not necessarily like physiologically um, advantageous. However, it looks beautiful. And right. so there's there's the value in it. What is we're trying to looks, do in yoga isn't it necessarily beautiful. it looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So why aren't there straight lines? Because there's because we're actually, well, this is getting deep, but we're like, we grow <laughs> in spirals. <laughs> yeah. Everything okay. from like the first cell division happens in a spiral, even mm-hmm. in a, this is more of like um, a conceptual idea. So I don't, I take it with a grain of salt, but like even your DNA, the very like building blocks of our um, growth and structure is a helix. So right. bones grow in spiral for, you know, like, you know, things spiral around each other. Um, 
and because of that, there's no there's no need for there to be any straight line, and there's really no there's really nothing encouraging growth in a straight line. Mm. There's I feel like for me, what's really shifted like my practices is, is the concept of taking all of that energy that we tend to just fling out and really draw it inwards. You know, mm -hmm. when I first really understood the cue of root to rise that's what really shifted it for me. Like to feel the muscle you, that was the other thing that you said. It was like, participate in your practice, like actually engage in the things that you are doing, not only mentally, but like physically, like turn the muscles on around your fucking legs, like wrap them, you know, fire it yeah. up. Because when you're doing that, it's an invitation to, what did you say? It was a part a, participation in your practice is like participating in your life. You, you know what? It's, I am, you really listen. Um, <laughs> Sometimes that's scary. Derek, I'm telling my you. words can come back to bite me. But no, I, I agree. Like I, I, I think yoga is a participatory practice. Mm. It is not a passive practice. It is, you know, it's like it is about engaging in your body intentionally. Mm -hmm. It's about engaging in your body powerfully and and with ease and gently. But it's always about it's always about making choices. It's always about like taking part in whatever is happening right now. Um, and, you know, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So if you've – your capacity to purposefully engage in, dry, you know, uh, rooting your heels into the ground is similar to your participation in, you know, where you stand on something. You know, you can, you can make these, like, energetic correlations. Um, but very basically, like, your, your practice is an allegory for your life. And so if your practice becomes disconnected and passive and at the whim of a shape or at the whim of, um, yeah, at the whim of a shape, then there is a, there is a potential relationship to a uh, sort of disinterested, passive approach to whatever else you're doing. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think I... A lot of us, I feel like, don't understand that, though, at the, at the start of it, because like moving into a practice, you don't really realize all the other factors that go into it um, until, you know, you kind of have to peel away those layers of the uh, aesthetic, right? You always go yeah. into like, well, things have to look cool. I definitely want to achieve this certain thing inside of a yoga practice. The pose has to look a certain way. Da, 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 da. Which is, which can be totally valuable. Listen, I feel like if I knew what honestly diving into my yoga practice was going to do to my life, I probably never would have done it. You know, like that would probably have been overwhelming to me if there were, if someone had said, yeah, yeah, this is cool. You can, because I also started with the practice that was a, a, a lot of stupid human tricks, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, do these one finger handstands, um, which I can't do nor ever could. But if I had known that I was actually diving into this, like take full ownership of your life, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it's so total. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> no, that sounds, that sounds very hard. <laughs> Personal responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you gotta like, you have to like. There's a teacher. Um, her name's Francesca Cervero, who is super sweet. I love her. She's over here on the East Coast, and one of the things she always says is you got to give them a little bit of what they want, so they can get what they need. And that's the same thing. Like you know, your entree into a yoga practice. That there is a value, kind of going back to there is a value to the aesthetics, and there is a value to the outside in approach to practice because it kind of it's like a gateway drug. It opens the door. You're like, ooh, this that it, to make that shape looks really cool. I, I kind of want to do that. I want to I want to see what I'm capable of there. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you've honestly done the work and you've honestly invested, you're on you know you're onto something so much deeper and so much different. Right. I have a question for you. I'm going to, I'm going to put you in a hot seat really quick. I just, this just popped up. Well, I popped in my head a second ago yeah. along the lines of straight lines, right? Uh, there, there's a double entendre there along the lines of straight lines. I can't help you with those. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what's your opinion? And I mean, listen, in all like to whoever practices and, and, whatever way that you do. That's awesome. Like we're, we're not here to knock anyone's yoga practice or, or their lineage or any of that. But what's your opinion on certain styles of yoga that like force people's body into shapes? Um, I mean, I, so I always want to like leave space for there to be value in 
everything. I, and, mm-hmm. and my like deep personal philosophical practice says that that has to be right. So that all being said, I, I don't think it's ever necessary mm-hmm. or the most kind or the most helpful or the most sophisticated thing to do to force something into something, you know, and that's, you get the way you do anything. So that shapes or even, you know, that's any, any aspect of the practice in general. Like, I don't like the idea. I don't like the energy behind it because that the energy behind it says to me, like, this is right. And that's wrong. And, and that's, that already feels problematic to me. It's the, yeah, yeah, I agree. The physiology behind it, I think is an easier sell because there's just, you know, like that's not how bodies work. That's not that it's, it's objectively unhealthy to force your body into a shape. It is f- I'm fine with working your body into a shape and developing and growing and, and, and encouraging, but there's no value in forcing. Does that okay. make sense as like a as an overarching idea? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I mean, I I I agree one hundred and ten percent. I think that I I did yoga for a long time where I was told that I had to do it in this type of way, and people would force me to go in. I mean, I've been physically manipulated to go into yoga poses, and when I look back at it now, after this is before I was a teacher, when I look back at it, I was like, yeah, my body could do that at the time, you know, with a little bit of like help and you know with some resistance and you know whatnot being kind of curved to the side, but was it the smartest thing? And did I get, like, did I really get anything out of it? You know, like that, that's you. And the interesting thing is, and in general, so I feel pretty strongly that forcing people's bodies into shapes is, is, uh, less sophisticated teaching than possible. Mm -hmm. And I will say there is, or can be something to the idea of, they are own inherent, either known or um, subconscious or unexplored resistance to something is a potential point of growth. Mm-hmm. So that idea of like, well, you know, if I always if I always just agree that I can't do it, then I'm probably never exploring the bounds of what's possible for me. And there's probably some beauty in there. And I, you know, if I, I just don't think the trade-off, I just don't think, you know, the, like the risk reward is, is there for me in that, like, yeah, I might've learned something about myself and I might've grown a little bit and I might've, um, uh, expanded my capacity, but I wonder if there was a better way to do it. Sure. Okay. Okay. I you know, like, I, I mean, I, I 100% resonate with, with all everything that you just said. I, I always just think about like, I guess where I, where I waver is the discipline was really good for me. Yeah. Like the discipline was super good because I don't know that I would have had the discipline to do it myself. Does that make sense? Like to show yep. up and like continue to do the thing over and over again. That worked. I mean, it, it makes so much. I mean, I, I, I feel that to a hundred percent. And, and that's why I'm saying like, I want it, like, there's a little bit of room because there is, there, there is some, there's something there. There is some, you know, um, value to it. But the yeah, truth I- is too, you did have the discipline because no matter how much someone wants to force you into a shape, I just keep using the same, the same, like, you know, phrasing, you still have the agency and the capacity to resist Mm-hmm. to you know disconnect to dis- so like to say i can't do this i'm done with you i'm out of here you you always have that capacity so it's not that the practice or the or the insistence is what created the discipline for you it just helped you to uncover it for yourself so ultimately it was still you okay yeah i'm into that actually i'm totally into that i i i actually never thought of it that way it was really just that reminder right yeah okay yeah and or or like you know what one of the things i think we do to be a good teacher is to set a is to hold a space and to set a frame and so essentially even even the teachers who teach in a way that i don't really 
jive with. And, and I think of it, you know, Matthew Remsky calls it somatic dominance. And I, and at that, when I heard him say that phrase, I was like, yes, that's it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in, in somatic or any kind of dominance. I'm not interested in, in the sort of dichotomy of right or wrong, or, um, you know, uh, if you, if you wanted it, you would do any, any of that kind of language. I'm, I'm just not, I don't, I don't support it. And, um, I do think that like, there are, there are times that it can set a frame and hold a space that encourages me or, you know, the practitioner to do work that they do really want to do, but maybe are on, maybe scared of, maybe unsure of, maybe don't even believe is possible. So there, you know, there's some, there's, there's something there. There's a there, there. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have another I guess another question for you when kind of switching gears to, well, to all, to, to all of this, the right or the wrong way to do the yoga, the poses and whether straight lines or whatever it is, makes sense or they don't. Right. Why do you think there's so many blanket cues out there? Why do you think there's so many bad blanket cues out there? Because, because, because human bodies and human, this, this is good. Human bodies and human movement are complicated and complex and nuanced and individual. But we, like as a yoga teacher, are often in the middle of a room of anywhere between two to 60 to 600 people. And there is no such thing as a cue that is actually appropriate in the moment and effective to all 600 people. But what else are you going to do? Like, you've got to say something, you know, like you, you've got to, there is a, job to be done the teaching is to be done so you you come up with vague and general cues or ideas for you to share that ha- you know like that have to either resonate or work or 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 you know um be uh, adaptable by any given practitioner so otherwise the only type the only way to teach would be to teach individually Mm-hmm. With you know, without a cue that's not quite perfect, the only way to teach is to teach individually. And I and I love group classes, as crazy as they are. I, I think um, I had an old teacher who used to say, "Group classes are the most dangerous. Group fitness is the most dangerous thing we could do." And and then like, there's a part of me that's like, I get it. And I love a group class, even even though they can be messy and non-specific. Um, I think they're it's a huge part of what the yoga is is the community. Mm-hmm. And I know that. I mean, I know that that's something that you hold extremely valuable and uh, true in your, in your practice and your teaching. So if we're going to be in a group, we've got to come up with ways to speak to the entire group that are on some level useful. And even the most um, incorrect quote, you know, quote wrong cue probably came from a place of value. You know, it's like, um, pretty much universally right now, the people who are are in the modern postural yoga practice that are like thinking about functional movement, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I say that as someone who believes that's me, but even there's this cue of like the idea of draw your shoulder blades down your back is like reviled. Like you can't say it. You're not allowed to say it anymore. But there's, you know, there was a reason why that cue came about and existed and it made sense and it said something important. It might have gone too far and, and been taken as, as a lot of these cues I think you're thinking of. They're like taken as the right way. Like this is the thing you should do always when really it was a logical response to something that was happening in either a student or a group of students' bodies. In like, you know, Ted and Jane, y'all probably – would be well served by drawing your shoulder blades down your back. So you say it to a group class and then all of a sudden that's something you're supposed to do is draw your shoulder blades down your back. And then years go by and one teacher teaches it to another teacher who teaches it to their other, you know, teachers and it becomes part of the zeitgeist and it's and it's a cue we say until someone questions it and until someone says, "Wait, that's a bad idea." And then the center of gravity shifts and now we're not allowed to say that cue anymore. It's, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it's important to understand, I mean, as a practitioner or a teacher, why the cue is actually happening. Exactly. Why, like, why do I want to draw my shoulder blades down? Like, why were you telling me to do that? And as teachers, that's our job. Like, as teachers, our job is to take the cues from our teachers. Because how else do we learn? I mean, take the, the things that our teachers have said and that we have played with in our bodies and we have a connection to. And then we teach them to other people. Mm-hmm. And that only, like, that must come with in my opinion, in my belief system, that must come with curiosity as to why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Like the curiosity is crucial. Yeah. I think that in at some point, there's a place in practice where, I mean, I find myself doing it all the time, right? Like how many things do I have to say in a yoga practice? But at some point, we kind of just have to toss all of that out of the window. Like we have to toss all the cues. We have to toss all the while, this is how I used to do it. You know, just ever like everything that comes with that. And also lean into like, truly like we really, for the most of it, have what's needed inside of us. Like that wisdom of really listening in a nuanced way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like really I'm, tuning in and dialing in to what's in there. When, when you do that, when you do like honestly listen in a nuanced way, you, you know, your body, I don't, I don't like to think of it as like a separate entity. Like a lot of times people, and I even say it, like your body is so much more intelligent than you are. You are, you are your body, by the way. You're like, we are our bodies. We're not just our bodies and we are our bodies. So right. we do have the capacity to know what is useful and helpful and supportive and generative if and when we honestly listen and and the work is getting better at listening that's the practice it's getting better at listening to you yeah to you know to being in the moment to seeing what's actually happening right now in this moment for real but that's work it's hard <laughs> i don't want it's so hard because <laughs> no. like sometimes it's not pleasurable yeah. sometimes it's you know yeah, it takes I effort don't... I don't wanna. <laughs> I totally, which is why then I love to go to classes where they just tell me exactly what to do and that I'm wrong when I can't do it. That takes all the, that takes all the pressure off of me. Uh, wow. I see what you just did there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awkward. <laughs> I'm going to go cry now for a little bit. <laughs> so what, I, I guess, you know, as both, students and practitioners, you know, with everything that is out there, like, what do we do? How do we figure it all out? How do we, how do we decipher it? Um, I don't know. It's a really good question. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean, I think you approach it with curiosity and with um, an understanding that There's a great wide field between, you know, there, so there's a Rumi quote just popped into my head, but this idea of like right doing and wrong doing, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. So that's true of the physicality of yoga. Like that's true of should my ankle or should my knee be over my ankle or can it be past my ankle or does it have to be that far forward? And it's true of, um, the like metaphysicality of the yoga of like, this is right. And this is wrong. And this is, uh, good for me. And this is appropriate versus this is indulgent or unhelpful or performative that somewhere in between, like somewhere in all of that is, is the practice. Mm. And if we approach our, if we like come onto our mat with this, with a desire to be right, that will be difficult. Right. It's just as difficult as if we come onto our mat with a belief we could never be right. Huh. I'm like, <laughs> I need a hard pause on this one. <laughs> yeah, that went. <laughs> I got heavy fast. Ooh. Yeah. So um, I got to go cry a little bit now. <laughs> wow. I never That's thought good. about I just. Good. 
I feel like every time I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I guess, yeah, the, I mean, the podcast is called Seeker and Sage. You know what I mean? So there's th- there's definitely something in me that's in that. But I feel like every time I show up, it's just in such a different way. And even the knowledge that I had before is so different now. And even, you know, like recognizing that I could go into a yoga class and teach really the same sequence, right? The same series of poses and teach that class never the same ever. Because I yeah. could teach to a muscular activation. I could teach to the articulation of a joint. I could teach to none of that stuff and teach to the energetics. Like there's just so much. And it's, I guess, just really, like you just said, it's like dialing in and listening to what's really, really needed. And what and what um, you're really honestly connected to in the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, I I was just listening to another teacher talk about – about teacher trainings and and they they said that they are constantly shocked by how many people come out of a 200 hour teacher training with substandard am- anatomical knowledge or information sure. and they hear this a lot and and the irony is like so I'm I mean you know we start I'm an anatomy just a total nut I find it both fascinating and beautiful and inspiring and and confusing and fun and and I, I love it I mean one of my greatest passions in life. And I don't believe you need to have, or I don't believe you need to have or always teach as it uh, with, with a deep anatomical foundation. Mm -hmm. That's a part, that's a yoga. That's a part of yoga. And it's not all there is. I think that you could, just like you said, like you could teach the same class, you know, talking about alignment or, you know, if you want to be cool like me about organization, um, you could teach that class then talking about the energetics. You could teach that class talking about uh, the emotions. You could teach that class talking about the, the you know, um, the gods and goddesses that underpin it. You could, you could teach that same class with a completely different perspective every time and always be teaching a really useful, beautiful yoga practice. What you, in order for that to be true is like honesty is required. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to teach that class and teach about anatomy and biomechanics and functional movement, then have an experience of it. If you're going to teach that class and you want to talk to what's going on in your heart, like have that experience of it and, and teach to what is true for you. In that, yeah, I guess. In, in that, that moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like Monday could be different than Tuesday. Like on Monday, you could be in the hip joint and just be like so curious about the complexity of the hip joint. And on Tuesday, you could be, you know, in your sadness and and be teaching to that. And both are like vital. Both are, you can't have a yoga practice without all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all important in their own different way. yeah. Yeah, I, I I find that I find that especially now and, and just these times, I I do want to help people in a, in a physical way, but I think that's really only an access to really you know invite change and growth in their lives. Period. I mean, I I I feel that to be true. I know that that was true for was and still is true for me. I mean, I got interested in anatomy because I had never had an experience of my body before I got into yoga. Before I got into yoga, like I didn't move around, I didn't work out, I didn't exercise, I was not physical. Um, I was an engineer, I was a carpenter, and so I like, you know, I but I, I didn't have any like experience of what it was like to have this body. As a matter of fact, I didn't like this body. I did everything I could to to disassociate from it. I mean, I mean everything. Um, and that's why for me, when I got into yoga the access point for me was the uh, like the engineering of it, the how it works and why it works. That's how my brain works. That's what I love in general. And so it was my way into everything else. And and it's a val it's a valuable way in. And I think it works for a lot of people. But it doesn't doesn't have to it doesn't have to be that. And it doesn't have to stop there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the anatomy stuff is you know it's an important like I guess to kind of just sum this like it, it is important to an extent. But it's not everything, and uh, like uh, from a teacher's perspective too, it's it's nice that we know big words. But do our students really care about those big words? 
are we serving them by using those big words? Ooh. Or are we like, or are we serving ourselves? <laughs> that was so real. <laughs> I often make fun of myself in class because I'll say things like, just, you know, call it like information recall, be like, Dude, move this, this, and this. And then I'll have to like check myself and be like, look at me using big words to try to impress you guys. And then continuing from there just to remember like, okay, you know, like keep it real. You're in the thing, you're in the moment, but keep going, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, there's also this idea of like the the white coat phenomenon there, it, it, it's possible. So let's leave a little space, right? It's possible that using the big words actually is serving our students because it allows them to trust us mm -hmm. enough to to go along for the ride. You know, like there is a level of like, okay, oh, you you know what you know, semi membranosis. Maybe you know what you're talking about. Maybe I don't have to be. Uh, maybe I don't have to hold back, and I get to, um, I get to believe you, and I get to assume that you've got my best interest at heart. And so I get to break down some walls between you and me. And, and so maybe using the big words is exactly what needs to happen. And uh. maybe it's performative and maybe it's because of my own insecurities. And so everything is up for grabs. But important to understand where you're coming from. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, I think that's ultimately the most important thing. The deeper as a understanding. Teacher. Yeah. Yeah. It's to understand where you're coming from, why you're doing it, yeah. what you know and what you don't know, what you've worked on and experienced and what you uh, only have a um, theoretical relationship with. And then, and like what you just said too, is like, and then when you go into a moment of like, cause I, I mean, good God, I have the biggest, you know, self, confidence, doubt issues of anyone I know. So there are many times where I use my intellect as, um, as a, as a shield. Right. And, and when I do that, what, what could, what's really helpful is to acknowledge it, to, to sort of like be vulnerable with it. Like you like, Oh, oh I'm just using my $10 words. And then to allow that to, to create a real connection between me and the people who I'm talking to. I understand. Derek, uh, your inquiry and your excitement from all this is just, I mean, it's always the best. Every time you, literally every time you've, you've come in and given a lecture, I've always learned something new. Although I've heard this lecture before, I always learn something new. And it doesn't actually tend to be the anatomical stuff. You always say something that just really leave the small little like nuggets of wisdom that you drop in there that really blow me away. Like how we, even the other one that you said about like how we don't pay attention to our backside of the body because that's the past, right? We don't want to look back there and actually deal with the stuff that's back there. Now I'm feeling very attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Here I was trying to, I led you into a false sense of trust. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to give you a sweet compliment. And then, you're right. You're right. I have to work on my glutes. Okay. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was a personal attack. I hope, I hope <laughs> you feel that. Yeah. Well, Derek, I, um, I, you know, I really do just love that I get to share so much time and space with you, not only in a professional setting, but in a personal setting. And, you know, we have, I know we have our own stuff coming up and we're going to be sharing. Well, I think it's important for the listeners and for the practitioners that happen to practice with me to get to know and experience you. Um, and literally everyone that has just, just raved and reviewed. So I can't wait to see what we cook up with or cook up next for everybody. Yeah. I, you know, the feeling is mutual. I, every time I get to work with you, we, I feel like we, we do really good stuff. I feel like, uh, we have, we have, a an understanding and, uh, similar love for this work and the world that the projects we work on, the time we spend, um, I think kind of, I get to up level you get, I think we were like, we help each other be better teachers. And I love that. We're both so curious. We're both so curious, which is the cool part about it. And good looking. And stunningly good looking. Yeah. I mean, I know you can't, I have, they say I have a face for radio, so I don't know what that <laughs> means, but <laughs> Because now I have a face for podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is so good. Well, this is the best. <laughs> honestly, I, I couldn't think of a better sign off. I feel like that that is going to be our sign off for the day. <laughs> until uh, until the next seeker and sage. This is Danny and Derek saying 
peace out bye guys